ಸುತಂಭೀಪಂ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನಂ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸೀನ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ವೇರ್ ದ ಹೈಯೆಸ್ಟ್ ನಾನ್ ಡ್ಯೂಯಲ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಹೌ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲಿವ್ ಇಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಲೈಫ್ಸ್ the secret is given in the 18th verse the verse which talks about kar- karmanya karma ya pashyat who sees inaction in the midst of all activity and how to live it is given in the verses 19 20 21 22 23 both for the jivan mukta the free while living who is in a householder life also for jivan mukta who is a sanyasi Uh, completely detached from mundane concerns in both cases krishna makes it very clear that even as a warrior in arjuna a fully enlightened person could continue to do that indeed as he krishna himself is living one can do that also or one can be completely detached and remain immersed in the bliss of brahman as a monk both are there then the fullness of vision the fullness of non dual realization is given in that wonderful verse um 4.24 brahma arpanam brahmavi at um, using the paradigm of the yagya the vedic fire ritual um the highest non dual realization is put before us very poetically the ladle with which offerings are given is none other than brahman uh, the fire is brahman the offerings are brahman the one who is offering is also brahman and we discussed it last time in details what it means now from the next verse onwards from 25 onwards what sri krishna will do is um he is going to use that same paradigm of the yagya the vedic fire ritual why he is using this yagya term yagya comes up again and again why is he talking about the vedic fire ritual is because that was the kind of religion that people were used to in those days so the basic idea of religion was that Uh, you are a vedic uh, person who would perform these fire rituals and you would con- be considered a dharmic a religious person so he is using that model which people were comfortable with but now he is elevating it to spirituality a whole range of spiritual practices ultimately leading to the full realization aham brahmasmi i am brahman that full re- up, to, up to that full realization all of that will be described in terms of yagya using that model um all kinds of spiritual practices like um, meditation like maybe fasting or even even eating or you know like uh, all religious practices all uh, secular so called secular activities all of them can be spiritualized so a, a whole series pranayama um, the yogic meditation the vows of fasting and what not all kinds of practices which many people do actually uh, i mean not only in hinduism every religion has a whole kind a whole set of practices all of those practices uh, sri krishna is casting them in the mold of yagya the vedic fire ritual um, what's the purpose ultimately all of that leads up to the final non dual realization that's the purpose of everything uh, all devotional practices all ritualistic practices all moral ethical practices all social service all that will be mentioned including social service everything and they and they are, they'll all be uh, described in terms of yagya vedic fire ritual and that they all point towards the final yagya the highest yagya what is that brahma arpanam brahma habi to see everything as brahman to see god everywhere uh, to, to to realize your identity with the absolute and live like that jivan mukta life of jivan mukti uh, that is the final goal all of that the whole range will be described as yagya from 25th verse onwards so let us come to verse number 25 ದೈವಮೇವಾಪರೆ ಯೋಗಿ ಪರ್ಯುಪಾಸತೆ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಪರೆ ಯಜ್ಞೋಪಜುಹತಿ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸಸ್ ಟು ದ ಗಾಡ್ಸ್ ಅಲೋನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯೋಗೀನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ರಿಸಾರ್ಟ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ಅದರ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಸೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಆಫರ್ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸ್ ಬ
um, sacrifice of the self into the higher self. What does this mean? So these are two kinds of two kinds of practices have been mentioned here. Two spiritual practices. First, the highest one. The second one, Brahmagnu apare yagyam yagyena eva upajuhati. Um, this is the uh, so so in all of them, consider that there is a fire, and into that some offering is being made. In all of them, that's the paradigm. Uh, that was the original form of the Vedic ritual. A sacred fire would be lit. Uh, offerings would be made, uh, there would be chanting of mantras and so on and so forth. So, the highest, the final one is what we have seen, Brahmaharpanam Brahmahavi. That alone is mentioned in the second line of verse number 25. Uh, imagine the ultimate reality, Brahman, that's the fire. The fire is Brahman. And just like we saw in verse 24. Then what is being offered? Our individual self, we, we are being offered, I am being offered into the fire of Brahman. What does that mean? Am I going to jump into a fire? No. What is meant here is, the individual self, the limited self, is offered into the unlimited self. The jiva is offered into Brahman. What does that mean, offering the limited self into unlimited self? Offering jiva into Brahman? What is this offering? It is nothing other than self-realization. Realizing that I am not the limited self. I am actually the unlimited self. I am not a body. I am not a mind. I am not this body-mind complex. I am the infinite existence consciousness place. Mano buddhi ahankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, not the intellect, not the ego, not the, mem the mind stuff, the, the me memory. But I am. Um, of the nature of Shiva, Chidananda, bliss, consciousness bliss. This is the offering of the individual self into the uh, higher self. After all, the individual self is nothing other than the higher self. I, Sarva Priyananda, am in reality Brahman. Under delusion, under ignorance, under not knowing my real nature, I think I am this individual being, this person, this body, mind, with a history, you know, personal narrative, uh, this altogether, this bundle, I think I am this one. Yes, I am very convinced. This is the limited self. This is the self under delusion. But this very self, not a separate God, this very self itself is the infinite uh, existence consciousness place. So this realization itself has been uh, imagined or reimagined by Krishna as a Vedic sacrifice. Like the fire is Brahman and the individual being is the offering. Uh, by self-realization, you are realizing your own infinite self that's the meaning of this and this is nothing more than what was just said in verse number 24 brahma arpanam brahma habi so that's the highest that's the ultimate krishna will say after giving a series of spiritual practices each of which will be presented as a yajna as a ritual at the end of it he will say actually the one i mentioned first brahma arpanam brahma habi that's the purpose of everything and that's the highest form of yajna then this is one type of yajna. Then the second one, in, in the first line of verse 25, he says, Daiva meva apare yajna. The other kind of yajna is the one, the ritual itself which you are used to. Is he discarding the Vedic fire ritual and saying you have to perform all these other kinds of spiritual practices but forget about the Vedic fire ritual? No, no, no. He's saying the Vedic fire ritual itself is a yajna. Of course it is. It's the prototype. So Daiva meva apare yajna means the, the yajna which you are all used to. You go and offer, light a sacred fire and offer a ghee into it with the chanting of mantras. Uh, people have desires to be fulfilled. You know, they want this worldly desires or other worldly desires if they have the worldly goals. But you are a spiritual seeker. So you can do it for the purification of the mind. See, I am pointing out something. That all the rituals in religion till today, people do it for two reasons. One reason could be a worldly reason, worldly or other worldly reason. Worldly reason means I want success, I want to get money, I want to win elections, I want to um, you know, solve the problems of my life. This, this is worldly reason. Other worldly reason, I want to go to heaven after death. All of these are still worldly, this worldly or other worldly. They are vishaya, objects, desire. We are trying to fulfill some desire. This is sakama. This is not for us. Krishna is not teaching that. Krishna is saying, you be spiritual seekers. So as spiritual seekers, 
can we perform yajna can we perform the original rituals yes we can why would we perform it we don't want anything from the world and from the vedic gods yes so if we perform it without any desire worldly desire or other worldly desire it leads to purification of the mind what will that do that will give us the fundamental prerequisites of vedanta viveka vairagya shramadamaadi shat sampatti mumukshutvam the four fold qualifications of vedanta they come they come as a result of the purification so the performance of religious rituals also is a very powerful way of purifying the mind by the way one thing i might i can show you i came across a quotation from swami vivekananda where he is saying you know his famous exhortation to have faith on yourself then he says here of course the self means the higher self brahman but also the lower self because the lower self is nothing other than the higher self under delusion um let me get that original quotation i want to read it out to you the original quotation is from volume 5 page 314 so sai vivekananda says what is the true meaning of the assertion that we should depend on ourselves here self small s means the eternal self capital s by self he means eternal self by self he means brahman but here even dependence on the non eternal self that means the jiva the ind- individual being may lead gradually to the right goal how as the individual self is really the eternal self under delusion let me repeat that the individual self is really the eternal self under delusion i the jiva because of ignorance i have forgotten or i, have, I do not see my real nature as brahman is exactly uh, i mean just what we are studying in vedanta sara the basic concepts is exactly so i am we can be saying that in simple english okay so daivam eva apare yagya daivam yagya means the yagyas rituals performed to the vedic gods um, worldly people perform them for worldly desires we we can also perform rituals for purification of the mind now in today's world most most of us do not perform vedic rituals we do not perform the vedic yagya but many of us especially the uh, the observant hindus we perform pujas or we participate in pujas so that takes the place of the vedic uh, rituals so as a vedantin uh, as a person who is doing shravana manana nididhyasana um, should i or is there any reason for me to take part in pujas or do pujas certainly he says that is also a yajna and that will give rise to a preparation for you know making your vedantic study effective so that is so two have been mentioned here the highest final yajna which is brahma gyan enlightenment and the other one is the ritualistic yajna that also is very useful that is also very useful then verse number 26 shrotradi nindriyan nyanye sanyam agni shujuhati shabdadin vishayan anya indriya agni shujuhati others offer the ear and other senses as sacrifices in the fire of self control others again offer sound and other objects of senses in the fires of the senses all right two more um, two more practices two more yagyas have been mentioned here one is control of the senses the five senses seeing hearing smelling tasting touching now our sensory activities can be converted into spiritual practice what is the spiritual practice there uh, it means uh, consider it it means control of the senses sense control 
So what is the yajna there? Always remember, there has to be a fire and something offered into a fire. What is the fire? The fire is control of the senses. And what is, what is being offered? Each of the senses. So when we control the senses, that is the fire. And the sense itself which is being controlled is the offering into that fire. So eyes and ears and the activity of uh, you know, hearing, smelling, tasting. So controlling the, the, um, the sense of taste, for example. Very important practice that the yogis do. I have given this example earlier of how a very delicious sherbat was offered to Swami Turiyananda in the hot uh, summer in, uh, in Belurmat many, many years ago, more than a century ago. And he took one sip of it and he said, take it away. And the novice, the monk who had bought it said, isn't it good? He said, yes, it is good, that's why. Now he did not need that practice, but he was teaching it. So what is the practice there? The fire of sen- sen- control, that the sense says, it's very nice, let me have a little more, I will I taste more, I want more, one cookie is nice, two more, one more cookie I will take. That is the uh, eagerness of the sense reaching out for its object. Now, what is the practice? Light the fire of self sense control. No. Stop. It has nothing to do with my spiritual life. It is extroverting me, making me, uh, making a useless habit which will harm my spiritual practices. Stop. So, withholding that flow, outward flowing uh, activity of the senses, I will not take um, uh, anymore. That is, the, that is the fire. And you are offering the sense activity into that. I um, remember once, many, many years ago, when I was a novice, so there was this wonderful Swami in Deogar Vidya Pit where I joined the order. And um, we used to, every night, we would walk with him for about half an hour. And we would have to, we had to recite Bhagavad Gita shlokas, uh, each of us. Um, so one night, I remember we were walking, uh, it was late in the night, maybe 9.30 or 10, and going back to the, the monk's quarters where the Swami's room was. And we had, he was surrounded by these white-robed brahmacharis. And there was a beautiful creeper with a, a fragrant flower. And one of the novices uh, sort of leaned forward and smelt it uh, very casually. And the Swami, so alert and observant, immediately he scolded. What is this? Uh, this is not... The characteristic of a yogi, this is the characteristic of a bhogi. Yogi is a spiritual practitioner. Bhogi is a person who wants to enjoy worldly pleasures. So just because something is available, do you have to taste it? So that kind of alertness, that is called sanyama agni, the the fire of sanyama agni. Sanyama means control, restraint, the fire of restraint. My nose tells me it's nice. Let me go and smell it. No. The fire is that no. Into that you offer the activity of smelling. The fire is no. And into that you offer the activity of tasting. So minimize. Control. Don't be pulled along by the senses. My nose says I want to smell that. My eyes say I want to see that. My my hand says I want to touch that. No. Why should you be pulled along? Um, There is a beautiful... Sanskrit uh, verse which says, Alas, what is my condition? By the servants of my servants, I have been made a servant. Kinkarasya kinkare kinkari aham. That the self, which is pure consciousness, the servant of the self is the mind. And the servant of the mind are the five senses. But the five senses have become so powerful, they have made me the self, their servant. Kinkarasya kinkari, kinkara means servant. So the servant is the five senses, uh, is the mind, and the mind servant of the five senses. But those five senses have made me their servant. I am the emperor of the city of the body-mind complex, and I have been made into a servant. No, that should not be. And to recover my independence, these practices practices are there. Sanyama Agnishu. So what the monk said to the novice in Bengali, I, I translated in English. Those who understand Bengali will enjoy it. And said, okay, re. Um, these are not the characteristics of a yogi, these are the characteristics of a bhogi. And in Bengali he said further, uh, 
Just because it's there, you have to eat it. Just because it's there, you have to smell it. Just because it's there, you have to see it. No. So that is one kind of practice, sense control. Then the second kind of yajna, which is mentioned here, is the opposite. Actually sensing, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, those are also yajnas. Very interesting, just the opposite. Instead of stopping myself from eating, actually eat. Instead of stopping myself from seeing or smelling, actually see or smell or touch. And then what do you do? At the same time, be conscious that I am um, offering this into the fire. How? Now the sense organs, they themselves become the fire. So the eyes are more precisely the capacity for seeing, the visual activity, the, the, uh, the capacity for hearing, the auditory activity, uh, capacity for tasting. So these powers, imagine them, visualize them as fires into which you are offering the respective sense objects. So I am eating. Um, cookie, very nice, I like it, very good. Then imagine the, the, the taste buds as a fire into which you are offering the taste of the cookies. Now that visualization itself is a spiritual practice. Don't do too much of it, that I am keep on eating cookies, you will get a sugar problem then. Uh, but it's a practice, so it's, it's a conscious experiencing. Mind nowadays mindfulness is very important. So mindful experiencing of whatever you experience, whether you are tasting or hearing or smelling or whatever it is. So these are two ways, two different kinds of practices. One is the fire of restraint with which we restrain the activities of the senses. One. The other one is let the activities go on, but visualize it consciously. Um, visualize that the power of, of seeing or hearing or smelling, that's a fire in which we are pouring the uh, offerings, the respective sense objects. Forms into the fire of eyes, sounds into the fire of ears, food into the fire of taste, um, fragrances into the fire of sm uh, the smell, and uh, soft, nice touch uh, into the fire of touching, skin. So this is another type of uh, yajna, another visualization. See, all of these spiritual act practices, all of them are being reimagined as yajna. Then one more, um, uh, another set of practices in verse number 27. Sarvaan indriya karmani, prana karmani chapare, atma sanyama yoga agnau, Juhati jnana dipite. Others offer the functions of all the organs and the pranas in the fire of yoga of self-control, lighted by knowledge. Alright, this is a deeper practice. First, the other practices which we have just seen. By the way, another kind of practice which one we often do in our order, many devotees also do it, uh, is food. You um, consciously eat. Before eating, you mentally offer it to God. Uh, to your Ishta Devata, and then it becomes prasada, uh, sacred food, offered food, and then, then you eat it. So it is food which has been offered to God, so the food which you get as prasad from temples, every food that you eat, whatever you are eating, even a cookie, even a cup of tea, mentally offer it first, and then you sip the tea, then you uh, put the cookie in your mouth. So all food, never, never eat anything, never drink anything without first offering it to God. So it becomes prasada. That's, a, that's also a very powerful practice. It's related to this uh, practice which we are just reading earlier. Now, number 27, a more subtle, little more difficult, but more important practice now. The earlier two yajnas were at the level of the senses. Yeah, one was in the level of uh, senses by controlling the senses, stop. Another one was not stop. Yes, you say, yes, we will enjoy it, but visualize that it's a offering into a fire. And uh, now, the control is not at the level of the senses, but the level of the mind. So he says, Sarvendriya Karmani, Prana Karmani Chapari. All the sense organs, five sense organs, five sensory powers. And Prana Karmani here means the activities of the five motor organs. Here Prana means the motor organs. The activities of five motor organs. The five sense organs, five motor organs. Ten in all. All of them are like offerings. All those activities are like offerings. Into what? 
atma sanyamagni here atma means mind in the uh, in the mental restraint not at just at the level of the senses at the level of the mind itself that's a subtler and deeper form of control a deeper form of control um where we are not just saying stop i will not enjoy this or stop i will not see this rather from inside mentally itself i will not i give up the desire for uh, uh, enjoying or or uh, you know following up on this or that particular activity or this or that particular enjoyment so difference would be so one activity for example is um like speaking so there are, there are various kinds of such um practices speaking vow of silence mahatma gandhi used to observe a vow of silence once in a week i think swami rangannath ji used to observe it i think on thursdays he would not speak um now that vow of silence can be observed at the level of the motor organ tongue i will not speak but it it at the deeper vow of silence is at the level of the mind just the desire to speak also has to be let go uh, i was just reading a very beautiful quote from carl jung the great psychoanalyst he says conversation is conversation with crowds is so damaging that i require days of quiet and solitude to recover from to recover from conversing with people i require days of solitude <laughs> so a lot of nervous energy is expended in speaking there is a rule so what kind of rule should we observe the rule is mitam cha hitam cha priyam cha speak less so put it to the filter of is this at all required you'll find lot of things are not required you speak less but not much uh, swami bhuteshwaran ji maharaj was the 12th president of our order so he spent many months in the himalayas in doing tapasya and spiritual practices uh, austerities he says i reduced my speaking to the minimum i would always ask is it necessary to speak of course he would have very few occasions to speak when he only when he came across a few other monks otherwise no and he realized that almost nothing has to be said really and he said days would pass without speaking even once but that's from deep inside that um, desire for speaking also is not there only when required so mitam little Uh, he pointed out see i was not observing a vow of silence a vow of silence will come later actually in the next verse but here from inside there is a restraint inside from the mind itself there is no desire to talk so that's a much deeper level of practice um, he said i was not observing the vow of silence it was just that i was saying is it necessary to speak that itself reduced my speech to such an extent that about days would sp- pass without speaking a single word so that's mitam hitam is it useful or beneficial what i am going to say is it any good any does it serve any purpose do, is it does it do any good to people so hitam and priyam it has to be sweet it has to be affectionate it has to be kind not harsh i like that statement of mark twain where he says those who claim to be fond of the brutal truth they seem to be more fond of brutality than the truth <laughs> so i am brutally honest no you are fond of brutality more than honesty often you will see people who are very harsh uh, they say i am very straight forward they can't take much straight straight forwardness themselves <laughs> they are often very sensitive to their criticism directed at themselves that monk i mentioned in in deoghar uh, who under whom i was so lucky to join the order in the, my first initial years So let me give you one example of what is meant here the internal control not just at the level of the ears or the tongue one day we were walking past a group of students the usual path he would take for a walk and the monk suddenly said that let's take by the other path now so we went to a different path i asked why and he said look they were talking about me and so i don't want to listen You see, it's just the opposite of our usual uh, tendency. What are they saying about me? Good or bad? Good, I'm very happy. Bad, I must listen. I'll get very angry with them, but I must. They're criticizing me. I must listen. No, don't listen. Don't listen at all. Good, no need to listen. Bad, even less need to listen. Don't listen. 
similar thing I, I, I have told the story earlier. In the Himalayas, I met this monk. People are so worried about what other people are thinking of them. So just the opposite, I met this monk in the Himalayas. Very uh, daring kind of monk who lived alone in, in the mountains there. So there is one incident where a group of other monks, you must know that in this mon the monastic community is also small, is small and also very gossipy. So the group of, uh, a couple of monks came to him, this Swami, and he's, they said, Swami, do you know what they are saying about you in that ashram? In Hindi. And this Swami replied, It's all true. Without even asking what, what they are saying in Hindi. It's all true. The, the, the monks were taken aback. But Swami, you are, getting, you are annoyed with us. No, no, no. You want to know whether there is any truth. Whatever the, the rumor is. Take it that it's all true. Do you have anything more to say? The, the other monks, those monks, they, they beat a hasty retreat. So you must be like that. From internally, from the mind. This is no desire to listen to your praise of yourself, nor is there any desire to listen to, uh, you know, rumor mongering or scandal mongering. No, not at all. Not at all. So, I am a servant of God. I am a bhakta, devotee. I am a seeker after spiritual realization. What do I have to do with the praise of the world or even the criticism of the world? It's all meaningless. Just drop the whole thing. Praise and criticism, both as meaningless. And remember, if you are elated by praise, to that extent you will be depressed by criticism. It both work in exactly the same way. If a few good words makes me happy, a few critical words will bound to be, it's bound to make me unhappy. Swami Vivekananda says, Slaves we are, slaves to a good word, slaves to a bad word. We must be independent. Then, so that is, that's the rule about speaking. Mitamcha, hitamcha, priyamcha. Speak less, speak what is beneficial and say it sweetly. These are the things which come from inside. Now a variety of other practices in verse number. Um, 20. So let me just give you the, this verse. What did we read? Sarva Indriya Karmani, the activities of the five senses. Prana Karmani Chapari, and the activities of the five sense organs, or the motor organs. Atma Sanyama Yoga Agno. In the fire of internal restraint, that is mental restraint, mental control. Juhati. Jnana Deepite, illumined by the knowledge, the, the light of Viveka. Here it does not mean enlightenment, it means that Viveka has arisen. I must realize the eternal, I must realize God. By that Viveka, by the light of that discernment, I practice these, this kind of control. So which one should we practice? Level of senses or at the level of mind? First level of senses, then the level of mind. First level of senses, the tumult, the, the noise must be quietened a little bit. Otherwise I cannot directly practice at the level of the mind. Then a set of several other practices, all, all uh, imagined as yajna, are mentioned in verse number 28. Drabhya yajna stapo yajna, yoga yajna statha pare, swadhyaya jnana yajnasya, yataya samshrita vrata. There are others who sacrifice through gifts, others again who sacrifice through penance, and still others who sacrifice through yoga. While there are others aspirants of austere vows who sacrifice through knowledge from scriptural studies. So, multiple uh, practices. Dravya yajna. Here, yajna means not the um, practice of doing something. The one who practices um, this yajna is called the yajna. The one who has this kind of yajna practice. Uh, the person is being mentioned here. The practitioner. What are the yajyas? What are the practices? Dravya yajna, one. Tapo yajna, the, the yajna of vows, uh, of, of austerity, sorry, uh, or penances. Third is yoga yajna. Patanjali yoga is mentioned here. And how do I know that that is what is mentioned? You can see Shankaracharya's commentary. So, uh, the yogic practice of meditation. That's one another kind of yajna. Swadhyaya, chanting, recitation, memorization. That's one kind. Jnana Yajna, what we are doing, study of the scriptures, Shravana, Manana, Niridhyasana, that's another kind of Yajna. All of these are practiced by Yataya, Samshita, Vataha, those are firm, sharp vows who 
consciously, deliberately follow these practices, vows, strict routine and regime, regime they follow. Yata, yati means monk. Here anybody who practices these ones, they are called monks. Uh, they are like monks, monk-like. How do you know that only monks are not mentioned here? Because something like Dravya Yajna is mentioned. Dravya Yajna means giving away of material possessions, donations. So it, obviously monks can't be meant here because they don't have, they are not certainly supposed to have material possessions which they can go around donating. So what are the, <coughs> what are the practices? Dravya Yajna. Dravya Yajna is um, the sacrifice or the giving of material goods. So you give possessions, you give, um, um, you know, money, donate to good causes or to, you know, like worthy people or people who need it. And that is, that is a kind of yajna, that's a yajna. So what is the fire? The persons who are receiving it is the fire. And what is the offering? Your possessions are the offering. It could be your possessions, it could be uh, money, it could be service, whatever you are offering, your time, energy. So those, specifically here, dravya means material goods. Offering of material goods or money, that's one kind of spiritual practice itself. You have put hard work, effort into that and that you are giving away. I, uh, one gentleman who lives in Texas was saying that they were very badly affected by floods a couple of years ago and their house was flooded and they lost a lot of their belongings, they were, they were all damaged by the waters which they had collected in their life over 20-30 years. And the gentleman said, I felt so relieved afterwards. All that junk in my life, I mean, they were good things also, but I, I never really used them. They were just there. They are collected over the years. They are gone. He said, I feel lighter. And that's a very interesting thing. When we have possessions, this is mine. Even a small thing, a little bit of our mind has gone there. Our mind gets scattered into possessions. The fewer the possessions, the better. Dravya Yagya, give away. Swami Vivekananda has a very, in his intense, this poem, um, give and give and never look back. He who looks back, his ocean dwindles into a drop. You have given like an ocean, but if you start calculating, I have given so much, this is the ocean dwindles into a drop. So uh, never look back, let it go. One must learn not only the art of accumulating, Working hard and getting money and possessions and land and, um, you know, goods, material goods. But also the art of letting things flow. It comes into your hands and then you divert it and you let it go into useful um, channels where it, they will do good. Many people have the ability to accumulate but not the ability to let go. And this has really nothing to do with people who are rich or poor or, you know, middle class. It's a mentality. Somebody says, you know, the prosperity mentality and the poverty mentality. Prosperity mentality is, you feel empowered by whatever you have, you feel empowered. I've got this much money. I've got the, this kind of positions. And this, this is my power to do good to others. Power to make others happy with this kind of money and goods. And the poverty mentality is, I've got this much only and others have got so much more. I must accumulate. I'm unhappy just by looking at others and, and trying to get more and more. Remember, the more we hold on to dravya, dravya is material good, the more we are trapped. When I am holding on to something, uh, so I am uh, holding on to a particular object, my phone, I am holding on to it. But then I am also trapped. So I am not free also. I am holding on to it. it and it is holding on to me then. So one must be able to let go. And um, I have noticed it, how interesting it is in this country, for example, in the United States, there's always uh, has been for a long time the culture of um, you know public charity. So there have been these super rich people who have accumulated a lot of money, and then uh, they've given it away. Uh, I go to the New York Public Library, the Schwarzman Building, and really, I don't think in to, in today's world any government would have that kind of uh, spending power to spend on a project like a public library, you know, like of that that grandeur. So, uh, it is these people who collected money, you know, earned a lot, they were these super capitalists, but they also became philanthropists. 
the classic example of um, John Rockefeller. And so there's an interesting connection with Swami Vivekananda when he first came. I don't know, was it in New York? Uh, he was staying with uh, somebody and uh, Rockefeller at that time was an upcoming young capitalist already on his way to making his first millions. Uh, very brash and ambitious and sharp and aggressive. He had heard that an Indian philosopher monk had come. So he went to meet Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda was rather brusque with him. And he said, look, all your possessions are given to you, all your wealth is given to you as a trust for the welfare of others. So you should give to others. Rockefeller did not like that at all. He stormed out. <laughs> it was not in, in his um, you know, like psyche, his makeup to, that I'm going to do good to others, at least not at the beginning. But something must have struck a chord in him. Sometime later, he came back and he said, I want to see that monk. And he said he's in the library. So he goes to the library of that house and he sees Vivekananda sitting with his uh, head down, he's writing or reading something, I forget what. And Rockefeller goes up to him and throws a check down in front, like a check he made out for a good amount to some worthy cause. He says, see, I've given this, this money. Maybe it was his first big donation. And he says to Vivekananda, you should be happy, you should thank me. And Vivekananda looked up and he said, it is you who should thank me. And he went back to uh, you know, his uh, reading or writing or whatever. And it's true that nowadays, why do we know Rockefellers? Because of the Rockefeller Foundations, the enormous philanthropic activities worldwide. That's why he's known today. If he did not do it, he would just be another forgotten rich person. Um, interesting connection to India. And Swami Vivekananda in India, the, when India first started the Green Revolution, the kind of hybrid wheat which was uh, used for the Green Revolution, it came from the work of a um, geneticist Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug, uh, he developed this kind of hybrid wheat which became, which powered India's Green Revolution, making it self-sufficient in food. And this scientist, was actually sponsored by a Rockefeller Grant. So we see the connection to Rockefeller, Vivekananda, India, and coming all the way down to our present age, making India self-sufficient in, in food. Anyway, why did I say Dravya Yagya, giving away? Another nice uh, uh, story, I, I mean, real thing is that there was this monk, I don't know if he's still alive in India, who lived under a, a tree. In fact, he, I think he's still alive. He lives under a tree, has no positions except his little piece of cloth. And from early in the morning till sunset, people keep coming to him. He's a wonderful um, teacher. People keep coming to him, uh, simple villagers. And they keep bringing gifts, food and clothes and money. And the whole system is that he starts with zero. And uh, his system is, he calls it zero, zero. So he starts with zero and ends the day at sunset with zero. So he has this group of volunteers who immediately keep giving away everything that comes. So by the time the sun sets, nothing more is left. And the monk is still sitting uh, uh, under the tree. So zero, zero. Now, that is, of course, he's a monk. Uh, householders don't try the zero, zero. You'll be in deep trouble, especially in this economy and in this, uh, in this world today. But the idea is Dravya Yagya. Consider giving away of material goods and money as a spiritual practice, as a yajna, as a sacrifice. Tapo yajna, austerities, vows taken. So, for example, I mentioned the vow of silence. So, here the vow of silence is mentioned. What is the difference between what I mentioned earlier? What I mentioned earlier is a deeper practice. From the mind itself, there is silence. I am not, you know, I am not repressing a desire to speak. But here at the surface level also one can take a vow. I will not speak. No matter even if there is a desire to speak, I will not speak for a day or three days or a week. Uh, be careful. It should not lead to repression hmm. or to, to suppression. Uh, one day is good or two days is good. Vow of silence. Um, fasting is a typical example of this kind of a vow. So I will not eat today. Um, so in Shivaratri, for example, in our monastery, we fast the whole day and we do not sleep the whole night. We engage in, in meditation and in chanting and in uh, observing the Shivaratri puja. 
so that not sleeping that particular night and fasting throughout the day that's a vow tapa uh, literally consciously deliberately controlling the body and mind what they normally want to do at this time i want to sleep at this time i want to eat no no harm will be done for if you do it for one day or two days like one day let's say uh, or half a day i don't eat no harm will be done in fact a lot of good is done to the uh, body if you if one fasts a little bit tapo yagya so there are many kinds of tapas tapas means literally it means heating the heat or energy generated by restraint yoga yagya the whole meditation system of patanjali yoga itself is imagined as a yagya as a fire ritual where uh, you have a asana how do you sit how do you breathe uh, how do you withdraw your mind from the external world pratyahara and how do you uh, focus your mind dharana then how do you concentrate meditate dhyana and then finally samadhi the whole system is taken as um, yagya as a as a like a it's like a fire ritual swadhyaya literally swadhyaya means self study technically the meaning of swadhyaya in vedic times was vedic chanting vedic chanting proper vedic chanting with training that was swadhyaya but in a general sense you can extend it so any kind of recitation of hymns uh, any kind of recitation of stotras memorization this is another kind of yagya swadhyaya is a kind of yagya swadhyaya literally self study but specially recitation chanting why can't it be just self study reading books no because that is mentioned in the next one gyana yagya the yagya of knowledge by knowledge here it does not mean uh, uh, generally does not mean reading encyclopedias or something like that here it means reading up the scriptures read uh, upanishads and gita like we are doing now shravana manana nididhyasana systematically study these texts think about it and meditate upon your conclusions shravana manana nididhyasana this is gyana yagya this is a practice and this is the practice which we are doing right now in fact this is gyana yagya yataya the so those who do this consciously deliberately samshita vrata samshita literally means sharpened so sharpened in the sense we are deliberately and consistently doing sometimes once in a while listening to a, a spiritual talk or reading casually reading a spiritual book uh, that anybody does that does not mean one is a spiritual seeker systematically doing it as a lifelong practice this is called uh, samshita vrata of sharpened vows and such people are as good as monks yata the art monks yati means monk Okay, let's look at the activity. There's a lot of activity in the chat. When we forcefully control the sense of taste and the rasa or desire remains of conscious mind, how do you? That will be overcome later on. In all sense organs, when you control it, the desire for it will remain in your subconscious mind. It's a tendency that's not so easy, easily overcome. Um, Gita, Sri Krishna says, "Rasa vardhyam." The desire, the subtle taste of it, is left behind in the mind. Rasopyasya param drishtva nivartate. Only after enlightenment is the finally you get freed from all kinds of worldly pulls. But up to that time, one must struggle. That struggle itself is the yagya. One must not give in. One must not become a servant to the senses. You say that you know how we are tricked. I am fulfilling my desires, not my desires. anybody who has battled with addiction knows the difference between my desires and an addiction the sense organs you know eating a cookie you might not might not think it's an addiction it's the same thing in a in a milder form uh, it's the sense organ which is demanding and we are rushing around to fulfill those demands so uh, to make an effort to control that is uh, yagya rafael is asking how can we make sure that the sense control doesn't turn into mere repression which can that is true one has to be careful but in these days the danger is the opposite there is less repression and more sort of letting go and uh, do whatever you <laughs> like that is more a danger these days than uh, you know very strict discipline and self control leading to repression um, l- so common sense is good common sense is good balance is good Oh, Gabriel said, "I keep breaking. Have I been breaking up?" 
No? No. Prabir Bhasa is saying, what is the purpose of the second kind of verse, second kind of Ja verse 26. Second kind of what? Yajna. Oh, you mean the visualization of offering all this. Yeah. So when I am actually enjoying something in the world, you cannot stop it. You have to eat. You have to talk with people. You have to do activities in the world. How do you, can you convert those into spiritual practice? You, you can have this practice of Whatever I'm seeing is an offering into the fire of my eyes. Whatever I'm hearing is an offering into the uh, fire of my ears. It's a visualization. And uh, that itself is, is a very elevating practice. Notice how it uh, gives you a distance between those activities and yourself. You are the awareness. In your light, these activities, these yajnas are going on. Otherwise, what happens is, I am seeing, I am hearing, I am smelling, tasting, touching, walking, talking, fighting. No. I am the consciousness in which these yajnas are going on. A little psychological gap appears because of this practice. It's mindfulness also. One is aware of what one is doing. Girish says, control the senses. You mentioned Krishtav Koch. Became a vegetarian result of his studies of consciousness extension. Does Jivan Mukti invariably become vegetarian? And or is vegetarianism a necessary condition? No, it is not. It is a good practice. But it is not a necessary condition. I mean, you can just look at it this way. Uh, in just about, uh, in, in many, many religions. So, for example, most of the Buddhists would, uh, people are amazed to know, that most of the Buddhists are actually non-vegetarians, including uh, the, um, the Tibetan Lamas. They are all meat-eating people. Naturally, in the Tibetan plateau, you don't get many vegetables. I think the Dalai Lama himself became vegetarian much later, when he, after he came down to the plains in India. Um, so, most of the avatars, Rama or Krishna um, or Jesus or, uh, um, or the great uh, prophet or whatever, uh, all of the great founders of religion, you'll see majority of them were actually non-vegetarian. And it's just a matter of um, your culture, uh, your uh, food habits. So is vegetarianism good or bad? It's not necessary. No, it's a good practice. Swami Vivekananda, who made it a point to eat non-vegetarian food, he always said that uh, deliberately practicing vegetarianism is actually a better practice. It's a good practice. But one must not make it a, a matter of overwhelming in, uh, importance. Why he consciously de-stressed, gave, gave less importance to it, is because in Hinduism we give a lot of importance to it. It is overwhelmingly uh, important in so that it becomes as if it is totally indispensable for enlightenment. No, not at all. Nothing like that. But it is a more sattvic state. I have seen practically among the monks I have seen in our order, for example, uh, the monks who come from Bengal or uh, from the eastern part of India, many of them, they come from non-vegetarian uh, food habits. But many of them, those who take non-vegetarian food also after some time, you know, in years of monastic life, they do give it up. Uh, it's not as a Deliberate practice, they just don't feel like it anymore, they don't like it anymore. That also happens, that we have seen. What about offering our karma? Of course, offering our karma is karma yoga, that is the biggest thing. Um, in reference to this, you mentioned the broadcast, Paul Krugman, the economist, and comments on philanthropy versus taxation. Yes, that is true. I've forgotten exactly what it was, but I remember mentioning it. Which translation of the Gita has been used? You can use any translation. I'm using a very. This is not a particularly good translation, but it's small. It's a small book, <laughs> so it's published by Ramakrishna Mat in Chennai. There are many translations are available. You can use any one. Oh, it was in reference to a church trying to invest in money, and Krugman said something about banks or giving it back to the people. You are right. Uh, it was a church in California. Uh, which is a very wealthy church, and they are called Milton Friedman, Chicago School of Economics. He is a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, they had called him. He said, we are calling from such and such church, and uh, we have so much money, um, so much assets. 
So can you please tell us you're the best possible, you're like Nobel Prize winning economist. So can you please give us some advice on how to invest it? And Milton Friedman said softly, um, have you thought about giving it to poor people? So that there was a shocked silence and the gentleman from the church said, are you sure you're Milton Friedman? And uh, um, uh, so the economist said equally softly, are you sure you are a church? <laughs> that was the story, yeah. Gabriel remembers. Nidjar is asking if you are silent in talking to others but keep talking to yourself the mind. So not much thought control. Is it considered vow of silence? Yes, at least externally. So it's a vow of silence, tapa, where you are imposing external silence upon yourself. But as I said, uh, chattering away in the mind. So really still the kind of self-talk is going on. If that is also silent, like Bhuteshanji Maharaj said, Mind feels silent. There's no, there's no desire. Even without a vow of silence, there was no particular desire to talk. For days on end, he would not even utter a word to anybody. That is real internal silence. The opposite, what you are saying, is forcefully controlling outside. That may be good for a day or a half a day, once in a while, once a week maybe. I've seen monks who practice that. Not just monks, others also. That's good. It saves energy. Um... But too much of that can lead to repression. So there might be a lot of mental talk going on. We are used to talking. I have told you the story of a monk, uh, how he was following a vow of silence for more than a year, I think. He would not talk. He talk, would talk only with signs, in you know, sign language. So I was his roommate for uh, in one ashram. And the monk, he went to bed and all night long he talked fell asleep and started talking uh, verbally. Next morning I said to him, Swami, you were talking in your sleep at night. He was so shocked, he immediately denied, you know, in sign language, he said, who, me? No, no, impossible, like, <laughs> impossible. So that's repression, that one should not do. It's good to do it once in a while. Is it any use at all, even if there is mental talk going on? Yes, it is of use. Many of us, we are chatterboxes. So, the physically shutting down talking is also good. It's a form of restraint. In Krishna Mukti, Vishwanathan says in verse 4.28, is, is there a particular attitude to be held? Yoga, Yogya, Jnana, Yakya. Yes, the uh, attitude is that it is a spiritual practice. See, what Krishna is doing here is, all of these spiritual practices, they are yagyas. One thing he is doing is, is also elevating our conception of spiritual life. From rituals to higher spiritual practices. Don't just be stuck in ritual like the yagya or the uh, puja. So, study is a spiritual practice. Um, sense control is a spiritual practice. Vow of silence is a spiritual practice. Doing good to others is a spiritual practice. These are higher spiritual practices, higher than just ritual. Even ritual is, is a yajna, but the others are also imagined as or visualized as yajnas. You may not have a separate, one more separate attitude. We are studying Vedanta, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. And some special, one more attitude do we have to keep in mind? This is a yajna. No, no, not at all. Not necessary. You are doing it already. That's all right. That's what Krishna is saying. Study itself. I wanted to say, it's such a wonderful uh, spiritual practice. I was uh, reading the advice given by Swami Bhuteshanandaji. He is telling the monks in Bengali, Porbe, Porbe, Khub Porbe. You should read, read a lot. And he says, it is where the rare, highly qualified spiritual practitioner who can do without uh, spiritual study. We think that study of Upanishads and Gita and all of that is meant for advanced people. Not at all. He says it is meant for mediocre people like us. <laughs> for ordinary people like us, we need this serious, intense study. There are, it is the advanced ones, very few rare advanced ones with a little bit of instruction, they can go straight forward to enlightenment. Rest of us have to keep ourselves immersed in this kind of study. I have seen many monks who, who um, took up spiritual practice, study as a spiritual practice. 
one of our teachers, monastic teachers, when we were novices, told us, see, you don't read. What the read, reading which you are doing is not spiritual reading. You are flipping. Flipping means flipping pages, going up, reading book after book. Then he pointed out one monk. Uh, his name was Swami Sh uh, Shikshananda. Uh, he was a very old Swami when we saw him. He says, go and see how he studies. So whenever you go to this Swami's room, uh, he was very old and advanced in years. He would be sitting on his long armchair with the Bhashya, commentaries of Shankaracharya open before him. You go and bow down to him. He will look and he will nod and go back to his study. All the time. Those who have seen him, they know. I, I also remember. I cannot forget it. There was an atmosphere in that little room where he would stay. Something like a very elevated, rarefied atmosphere. He wouldn't say anything. He would just nod and he would say, Bhalavach, are, are you doing well? Good. That's it. Back to the thing. So, is it something that he has not read? He has read those things all his life. Again and again and again. He's keeping his mind there. That is reading. That is spiritual reading. Not reading new things all the time. You can read new things also. That's very good. I've seen a monk, very austere Swami. He was Marathi in Deogar Vidya Pit when I was there. Swami Nirlepananda, Vidyadhar Maharaj. So he had a very, and his room is also was very bare and austere. A uh, wooden desk, a wooden chair, one wooden cot, and that's it. To our change of clothes and uh, a very thin blanket on which he would lay, lie down. And all the time doors and windows would be open. No concept of privacy. <laughs> you can all the time, whether he's sleeping, sitting, whatever he's doing, anybody can see at any time. There's, um, he's totally open to the world. And he would, his reading was unique. I liked it because I read so many different things. He would read one book at a time. He would borrow one book from the library, keep it on that wooden desk. The wooden desk would be completely bare and there would be one book. He would sit and read it for hours and end, finish it cover to cover, return it to the library, take the next book. So he would read many things, but there also there was this focus and discipline. Swami Ranganath Anandaji, who would intensely read all his life, all his life. At the end of his life, he was the 13th president of our order. Uh, when he passed away, uh, most of his large library, a part of it was donated to the uh, Brahmachari's library in Belurmat, where I was the librarian for a short while. So I saw those books. Two things I noticed. How active reading, how all those books, he has read them, they are underlined, comments, marks, uh, remarks. Uh, and, you know, a person who is engaged with the material which he is reading. All the time. And whatever time he could get, he is reading that book. Uh, so all the books had been read and you know underlined uh, with you can see his thought progress his his comments on what is be his reading that's one thing we noticed second thing i noticed was notebooks from his early days where ordinary books which are now available you can always buy them on easily on amazon or something he did not have money to buy the books so with a pencil he has copied this aparoksha anubhuti we read and drigdrishya viveka he has copied those books because he didn't have money to buy a, a cop, uh, like a printed copy of the book. He borrowed a copy and he wrote it down with a pencil and paper. You know, so that itself is useful. See, we may have a wonderful library. Only 10% read, 90% not read. Books are there <laughs> just for show. I think who called it? Anti-library. You have a library and an anti-library. Anti-library is the one you have not read. That is there imposing, <laughs> looking down at you. So much knowledge not read. So in Ranganathanji, there was no anti-library. He had read everything. And one reason was he would copy it down. One monk told me that often uh, the, an excess of means are at the expense of the ends. When you have money and books and internet and uh, all knowledge is there for you. Means. Excess. The actual amount of learning and absorption seems to have gone down compared to some of those older scholars. I remember the first time I saw this modern technology being used, I was learning Nyaya from a Nabya Nyaya, from a Pandit in the Asiatic society, um, a, a traditional Sanskrit scholar. He would come and teach. So he would painstakingly write out the Sanskrit verse on the blackboard. 
and for the first time so at that time those cam- mobile phones with cameras had come so this young student so there were students from all over the different different campuses i was the only bunk who was there others were there so this young student he would take a picture so the scholar the pandit wrote something painstakingly and instead of taking notes student would take a picture of it in half a second done and the pandit was so furious he said if they at least bothered to write it down at least once in their lives the material would pass from that from that board to their minds to the notebook now it has gone straight from the board into the memory of the of the phone whether he will ever read it or see it again is doubtful even if you write it down once raghunathan ji all his life when he was in advanced age a president of the ramakrishna order most of the day was spent in study all kinds of things serious study when the doctor told him not to read so much he made a system of the attendants they would read to him by turn so they would be reading going on for him for 6 7 8 hours a day uh, because he was not allowed to read himself more than 1 hour or 2 hours a day because of the doctor the stress one of his attendants told me a new book on the holy mother was published and um, so swami ranganathan ji told me to read it out to him so daily for an uh, for 30 minutes or so i would read out that book and other books also were being read out after the book was finished the swami said to me that attendant monk said swami ranganathan ji said to me all right give it to me now i'll read it and the attendant monk said but swami we have been reading it all this time for the last one or two weeks we were reading it every day um and the swami said that was for you now i'm going to read for myself so he made that <laughs> that monk read it also <laughs> so, uh, with on the excuse of reading it for for himself um Swami Suhitan used to tell me how Swami Premeshananda was a great inspirer of young men who became monks later on. He was a disciple of the Holy Mother, Masharada. How he would his techniques of making people read. He would these young students who, who were spiritual seekers who were interested in spiritual life would come to him, and he would say to some of them, he would say, "There is this very interesting verse. It says one or two words. I remember. I can't remember the whole verse. Can you find it out for me?" And this young man would rush. and look to the whole geeta look searching for see curiosity searching is a very powerful motivation if i just say if you just say read the geeta person may or may not read but the swami has asked me for a verse and uh, when you are searching for something there is an extra energy and uh, inquisitiveness which powers your study so this young man would go back and read the whole geeta trying to find the verse obviously it was a trick because the swami knew the all the verses by, by heart he every verse was just just like that for him so he would make people read um, just on the pretext of searching for something swami ranganathan ji had many many stories about his practice of studying the last book he was reading and we got it as a donation to our monastic library later on after he passed away the last book he was reading was zen and the brain it was a uh, neuroscience and sp- and spirituality big thick volume And the reason he was reading it was he had suffered a stroke and so he was very interested in knowing what was happening in the brain at that time i remember we all went to offer our pranams to him here is this 96 year old monk who would pass away in, in a few weeks we bowed down to him and he's explaining what has happened i felt something was going on there and then you know there's a, there's a loss of blood supply to this part of the brain and the death of some cells there and he's explaining it very calmly the whole process of his stroke <laughs> what happened now you can see in that book which was donated to a library he is underlining and the underlining has you know it's like this straight lines and then slowly going down like this is i i had seen him studying lying in the icu bed lying in the icu bed with the thick volume the book uh, with his glasses the that volume and a and a pen and he is underlining it and his hand is shaking like this you know and then he is underlining it the hand is going down i can't control it the line is going down like this yeah. till almost the last day of his life he was studying this is a practice all right so Gloria says success of all these practices 
seems to be depend on knowing the goal accurately and desire for the goal yes accurately knowing the goal and desire for the goal of god realization enlightenment that comes slowly even without that many of us we start these practices as um, you know just spiritual practices this innate desire to gain back control of the body mind system that itself is a goal even before we have very sophisticated philosophical understanding of the final goal of enlightenment even before that um i think so i have seen some raised hands dimitri i think uh good evening sanjay uh, a quick question uh, on uh, wednesday when uh, you had a lecture i asked a question and you mentioned that there is uh, later the way it will be explained and there is some uh, literature about, about this intuitive step like in order to get to the point of the true self yes uh, could you tell me where is it written is it vedanta sara in vedanta sara itself just ask me in the vedanta sara class i will point out the passage you can jump ahead and read it if you like but we'll we'll discuss it in detail when we come to that but it's towards the end of the book Rem- remind me in the vedanta sara class next time i'll give you the exact text numbers but it towards the end of the book you can skip ahead you can read it if you if you like thank you all right before i end uh i'll request jayant to put in that yeah a link for our uh, to make donations to the vedanta society of new york so whatever you can contribute these uh, it goes a long way towards sustaining the center in these difficult times we we'll leave it on it's in the chat jayant has put it in the chat i can see it i'll leave it on for a minute om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu